In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The importance of correcting one another. You are a chosen people, a holy priesthood, a royal nation, chosen for God's special purposes. This means that we're called to incredible holiness. The Old Testament is filled with stories of how serious God is, of how holy God is, and the type of holiness that He desires for His people. We were reading last week in 2 Samuel how David, excitedly taking the Holy Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, is put off by this particular event that transpires. The Ark tips over. And Uzzah, one of the priests, reaches up and grabs the ark before it falls, and Uzzah is struck dead. David is scandalized. Lord, this was supposed to be a joyous occasion. God was telling his people, this is the seriousness by which I take you to be a holy people, to be obedient. And this story can be multiplied many times throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so I want to discuss the importance of rebuking one another in love. As the scripture teaches it, for the purpose of the reward of being a holy people. For our God. For our God. Yesterday I had like the unique privilege of the only service or every only sermon I've ever preached where it was like I was conducting a yawn orchestra. Like as I look over here, they were yawning. And I was looking over here, they were yawning. And then over here, incredible yawn. Oh, and a yawn from you. It was amazing. It's because I, was, I went through so many passages. And I'm sorry, I'm going to do it again. Because <laughs> even if you yawn, I want you, to, I want you to learn this, okay? I want you to understand because... Here's what I'm convinced of. Here's what's happening in our culture. We have a, a culture that's becoming increasingly weak, unable to receive admonishment and refusing to give admonishment. Because what we're being told is, you do you and I'll do me. And I'm not my brother's keeper. And it's not your job to judge one another. Isn't that what Christians think? It's filled with half-truths that only lead to further destructive behavior. And so we need to have an understanding of what the biblical paradigm is for correction and instruction and reproof and righteousness, as St. Timothy says. As is so often the case, my sermons are oftentimes formed around my personal interactions with the community, the beloved community of the church. And I think Pope Francis was right when he said that priests need to smell like their sheep. It's in the context of being with all of you that the Lord so oftentimes, almost every week, tells me what I'm supposed to talk about. And it so often lines up exactly with what the passage of the rip reading is for the day. So you have two readings, one from Matthew, or I'm sorry, one that I'm going to give you from Matthew, but one from Galatians where Paul opposes Peter, and that becomes the context. Why did Paul oppose Peter to his face? But I'm not going to actually get into that particular passage. I'm going to give you the heart that Paul would have had in opposing Peter to his face. I'm not interested in dealing with the theological matter of Paul opposing Peter and everything that was going on there with the Judaizers. I'm interested in giving you the heart of Paul, why he opposed Peter to his face when he played a hypocrite. So, understand that the tradition which Jesus entrusts to us is taken from a long tradition of the Old Testament. And I'll read some of the passages Jesus would have had in mind. But here's the primary commandment where Jesus tells us the basic rubrics of how to oppose one another. He says this in Matthew chapter 18. 
If your brother sins against you, go and tell him to, don't tell him his fault between you and him alone. First alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother back. As in, you lost him when he was openly sinning. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you. That every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. He's getting that from Leviticus. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the whole church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So you'll notice that I'm following up this week in the theme of last week, which was the anathemas. And now we're talking about how we handle this within the church, this local church body. Last week, anathemas were what is done at the magisterial level, the bishops. This week, it's what we do inside of the church when it comes to sin. And here Jesus gives the foundational idea of how we handle it within the church. He says, if you see your brother sinning, go talk to him personally. If he refuses to listen, go get one or two more witnesses. Bring them. You need two or three witnesses to establish a case against a person. That's why he's doing it. This is from the law. So you, once you bring those two or three witnesses and the person still refuses, he says, now go call your whole church, the entire church, to call this person out. If they don't listen at this point, he says, treat them like a tax collector and a sinner. What does that mean? It means that they're not part of your community. They're refusing to turn from their sin. So as I say, I oftentimes... It's my interactions and, well, I'm dealing with someone who refuses to turn from their sin and so I have to work on, I have to deal with this. Luckily, I'm able to do it at a personal level. It doesn't, they've already put themselves out of our midst. It's their choice, not mine. I didn't even have to go these steps. But here's the reality. If we're openly living in sin and we refuse to change that sin, then please don't come here. If you're not willing to work on yourself, please don't come here. If you're not a member of our parish, that's a different situation. If you're a visitor of our parish, different situation. All together, come as you are. Come as you are. Now here's why. The reason why we have to do this is because we don't want to bring wrath on the rest of our community. This is what the scripture says, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. Lest you incur sin because of him. Okay. We don't have this mindset anymore, guys. We oftentimes think that that person's sin is just that person's sin. But no. The scripture teaches us that that person's sin is all of our sin. We will face the repercussions of our brother's sin. You, you've experienced this before, okay? Even if it's not like the wrath of God, you've experienced this before. What happens when you, when you talk to somebody who refuses to sin, to stop sinning? They get angry with you, right? And then you're tempted to do what? Get angry back. When we're engaging with someone who's refusing to stop sinning, they will try to make us sin. They will turn it on us. Yeah? Deflection. Right? Or they call it gaslighting now. Okay? That's what's going on. They refuse to accept it, so they put it on us, and now we've got to deal with their sin. That's why the scripture says, you know, rebuke a brother, but be careful with yourself, lest you also fall into transgression. So, there was, the important thing was in the Old Testament community, in the community of Israel, which gives us our moral lessons. When someone sinned in the community, oftentimes thousands of others suffered because of their disobedience. David was disobedient and counted how many people were in Israel, and all of Israel suffered. A grave tragedy. Many died because of David's choice. And oftentimes our choices in our community can bring down everybody else around us. How many churches have split because of priests who didn't remove the splinter from their midst. What 1 John calls blemishes on your love feasts. How many communities have been split 
because the divisive persons were not removed from the church. So it's important to understand that in the church, we are called one with each other to be holy. The other day, I, I said an offhand comment. It was a joke in front of somebody, and they happened to be holy. And so they didn't laugh at my joke. And what do you think that caused me to do? It caused me to shut up, didn't it? It caused me to be embarrassed. It caused me to stop telling those kinds of jokes. It caused me to be holy. See, that's what happens. But if we're with people who will just go along with our unholiness, then we will persist in unholiness. We cause each other to stumble and we cause each other to grow in grace. Okay. So, to take it a step further, let us consider the importance of being very clear about our disposition towards righteousness. Isaiah says this, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. D does anybody else feel like right now when we're engaging the culture, that's the only thing that happens? Like when you, when you look on social media, what's called good is bad. And what's called bad is good. It's a, it's a complete reversal of reality. So the only way that we can keep our community in a place of holiness is to make sure that we have proper designations for what is good and for what is bad. What is dark? What is light? Otherwise, we'll become confused. Otherwise, we won't stand for anything. Our society right now is so open-minded that it's closed-minded. It's an opposition to reason itself. Opposition to God itself. And the scripture says, whoa. It means like, I don't want this, right? You are, you are damning yourself. Woe to you. Woe to, when Jesus says, woe to you, Karazin, right? If the works that had been done and you and Sire and Titan, they wouldn't have repented. What Jesus is saying is when Sidon and Tyre were overtaken by fire, Karazin was in a worse place. Woe to you. The hell that you will face will be worse. Jesus says, this word, he says, whoever teaches anyone to not keep even the smallest part of the law, he shall be smallest in the kingdom of heaven. Woe to the person who stumbles a little one. It would be greater for them to have a millstone tied around their neck and thrown into the ocean. Woe to them. This is what a woe is. Woe to those who will not say what is right and what is wrong. St. Paul says this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 14 through 15. You guys are better at not yawning here. Well done. Maybe because it's the morning still. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person, have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. So now we have a second part here. It's not just immorality. It's also the teaching of the church. If someone rejects the teaching of the church, don't have any more conversations with them, that they might be ashamed. In other words, look, there's a big difference between having a conversation about beliefs that we struggle with, having a conversation because you have genuine intellectual curiosity, and having a conversation where you say, I know the teaching, I know it's being said, I reject the church, I reject the teaching. I want nothing to do with it. I won't live by it. I don't accept the word of God. That is the person to be avoided, not the person who has honest inquiry, honest debate, right? It's the person who, Paul speaking of a person who says, I reject it. So we have now two different kinds or two different reasons 
Four, calling others out. One is the teaching, one is the tradition, and one is immorality. Actually, St. Paul calls both doctrine. Did you know that? Your, your, your moral life is also your doctrine. Not just, your, not just the, your theological beliefs, but how you live is also your doctrine. Here's from Titus 3.10. As for a person who stirs up division, gossips, busybodies, people who want to get their own way through manipulative tactics, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with them. So, we see someone in our midst who's trying to cause tension. You want to make this person hate that person. You want people to dislike the things that you dislike. So, you try to get them on side. It's called snaking in politics. You go and you secretly have conversations with different people at different times and you try to triangulate those relationships in order to manipulate the outcome you like. And you notice that it's causing tension in the parish. You're one of them. If you meet one of them, avoid them. After two or three times trying to correct them, completely avoid them. I used to have a friend who, you know, kind of a bro, bro kind of a guy. And he had this, this motto, if someone acts like a jerk, I just stop talking to them <laughs> until they start acting like a human again. It's a good method. It's a helpful method because the whole point here is bringing shame and bringing fear. Ah, oh, so countercultural, isn't it? Fear and shame. Listen, fear and shame are, are two of the most profound and actually workable ways of keeping a community together and in check. Fear and shame. They're very, very helpful. They really are. Look, we can, we can make up all these little piisms all we like. Like, we can, we can play the nice guy all we like. When reality is before us, fear and shame are incredibly beneficial methods, and being nicey is not. Look, if one of my children run into a street, am I going to be Mr. Nice Guy? Honey, please don't run into the street. No chance. I'm screaming, right? If I see a car coming, I'm really screaming. I'm going to be really aggressive. Why? Because I care about them. <laughs> I have to. It's for their salvation. It's for their benefit. I, ha I don't have time to be Mr. Nice Guy, right? I can't. Like, I want to be a kind man. I want to be good and a kind person, right? I want to be gentle. I want to be, I want to be all those, those things that really we're looking for when we talk about niceties. But, I don't, but our job isn't to make other people like us. That's selfish. That's just selfish. Right? If we do that, we're just selfish. The only reason we should really care that much if others like us is if it's for their benefit to like us. That's why it matters. That's why it matters so much to have people like us. Is it for their benefit, not for our own personal. When you read the scripture, it becomes so... When you read the fathers, when you read the scripture and the fathers together, for the first 2,000 years, you... It's so clear that these men and women were serious people. They were serious. I'm such a goofy guy. I'm, when I read the scripture and the fathers, I just go, I am such a goofy man. <laughs> I'm such a goofball and compared to them. They're so serious about holiness. Luke 17.3 Pay attention to yourself. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Let me read that again, that clause. And if he repents, forgive him. We're so oftentimes told, like, you just have to start off with forgiveness, right? Like, someone comes up to you and kidnaps your family. Well, did you forgive them? It's like, well, that's a crazy response. That doesn't make a bit of sense. He says, if he repents, forgive him. Does God forgive you if you don't repent? 
Show me one passage. Show me one passage in all of Scripture that says God will forgive you if you do not repent of your sin. One time. Anybody? That's because it never happens. It never says that. It says, it says, confess your sins and he will be faithful and just to forgive you. Over and over again. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's with your mouth that you confess and you're forgiven. You receive justification. In the same way, if, if someone is refusing to turn away from their sin, you cannot have a restored relationship with them. You can be like your heavenly Father who desires their forgiveness, who desires their, their restoration, who's looking for every moment to be a peacemaker. But you can't have a restored relationship. It's not possible. It doesn't make sense. Even God doesn't do that. <laughs> okay, even God doesn't do that. So you see someone in sin. What are the instructions? Does the scripture ever say you see someone in sin and so forgive them? No, it doesn't. It says, it says pray for them. It says hand them over to Satan. It says remove them from your midst. It says ignore them. It says give them words of inspiration to turn away from their evil. It never says forgive them. Your point is this. Someone has to want forgiveness. They have to desire it or it's not going to work out. It's just going to hurt you. And you're, you're going to feel hurt too, trust me. If, you're, if you tell somebody, I forgive you, and they don't want your forgiveness, and they say, who cares? You're suddenly going to be shocked in the reality that something doesn't feel right. And that makes a ton of sense because you're not actually in good relationship with them. That's why it's shocking. Because something doesn't feel right. Look, the scripture says this. It says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. What that means is you can't be a friend to someone who rejects God and a friend to God at the same time. Jesus said to his apostles, I have called you slaves until now, but now I call you friends. Because a slave does not know what his master is doing. But now you know. So the apostles became Jesus' friends when they actually understood what he was doing and they accepted what he wanted to do. Before that, they were just slaves. They were following without true knowledge. In the same way, someone cannot truly be your friend if you are a friend of God. If they do not want to follow God, they are a potential friend. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. So don't feel the need to be the friend of the world. Don't feel the need to be in perfect relationship with someone who rejects God. You cannot be a child of God and be in perfect relationship with someone who rejects God. Those are contrary. Those are contrary claims. Look, if any of you are married, if I tell you I perfectly hate your wife, I reject your wife, Right? I despise your wife. I spit in the face of your wife. Will you be my friend? There's no chance. Right? And ladies, if I tell you that I want to punch your husband in the face every time I see his ugly head, are you going to be my friend? Probably not. Maybe some of you would like that. Probably not, though. Do you know why? Because you have a commitment to them. You'll, you'll, right? If I say that to a guy here, it doesn't matter how big Father Nathan is. You, you'll be tempted to punch me, right? If I tell you I want to slap your wife and spit at her, it doesn't matter how big Father Nathan is. I might get my head knocked off, right? Because you're committed to your wife. So someone who hates your wife can't be your friend. Someone who hates your children, can they be your friend? Uh-uh. Even quicker than if you hate my wife. You know why? Because my wife is an adult and she might do something that is a mistake. My children are just kids. So you have no excuse to hate children. No one has an excuse to hate children. If you hate my kids, I don't have any desire to be your friend. <laughs> Turns out, right? And I expect the same from you because you have a commitment to them. In the same way, but even more so, what is our commitment to God? 
commitment to God is that He is first in the heart. Okay, two more. Just two more. That's it. There are like 70 passages on the subject. I just picked the one. I picked the ones that would give you a well-rounded understanding of the situation. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 13. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. So, first of all, St. Paul says, you are so arrogant that you would let a person who's openly committing sexual immorality in your midst. That makes you arrogant by letting that person remain with you. You should be ashamed. You should have put him out of your church. This whole thing is completely being flipped on its head. Woe to those who call what is good bad and bad good. Instead, we're told that we're arrogant if we say that sexual immorality is sexual immorality. It's been turned on its head. I'm the bad guy. You're the bad guy. Because you believe that God's word is true. Do you know how homosexuality arose? And I'm not talking about a person who has an inclination, by the way. I'm not condemning that. I'm talking about a person who willingly continues and is persistent in their actions of homosexuality. Do you know how homosexuality arose, though, for the human race? Does anybody know? Parasites. Not parasites. What does Scripture say? Romans 1. There's your hint. Romans 1. They refused to acknowledge God. Idolatry. Idolatry was the beginning of homosexuality. It says that although they knew God, they did not like to retain the knowledge of God in their hearts, but gave God over, and instead worship created things, four-footed beasts creeping things. For this reason, God gave them over to do those things which are not fitting. Men with men exchanging the natural use of a woman and being with one another and women with women. It is a result of idolatry. That is the greatest form of insurrection. Okay, so look, if our choice is this, our choice is if we choose instead of God, idols, that is the greatest form of arrogance we can have. We choose idols instead of God. We reject God. This is what happened in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve knew better than God. See? We know better. Our culture, we've grown, we've progressed. We know better than God. And so what do we do? We rebel against God, and this is, this is where the arrogance is. Oh, I'm so tempted at times, because I'm such an unholy man, to trust my own experiences in life and not God's word. I'm so tempted at times because look, of course, I meet, I meet someone who struggles with homosexuality. I'm not someone who struggles. That's a different thing, a very, very different thing. I meet someone who's actively a homosexual and they're such nice people. And I'm so tempted to think, eh, maybe I'm wrong. I can't do that. See, that's arrogance. It sounds really humble, doesn't it? Maybe I'm wrong. It sounds humble. It's arrogance. Because as soon as I start saying, maybe I'm right, maybe God's wrong, now we've stepped into the realm of arrogance. Maybe God has it wrong. Or another tactic, maybe the scriptures are wrong. Maybe the fathers of the church are wrong. Maybe every saint who's ever lived is wrong. Maybe the magisterium is wrong. Maybe Christianity is wrong. Maybe there is no God. Okay, last one. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way, 
in order to save his life. That wicked person shall die for his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. At your hand. In the book of Genesis, God says to Cain, where is your brother Abel? And Abel says, am I my brother's keeper? Murderer Cain. The blood was on his hands. In the same way, Ezekiel says, if you see your brother sinning, he will die in his sin. And you will be in charge of his blood, Cain. You, Cain, will be in charge of his blood. Because you were too nice. You were too much of a nicey coward. Too much of a nicey coward. And because you were too much of a nicey coward, your brother died. You didn't love, you just acted like a nicey coward. <laughs> Look, the scripture is so incredibly clear how we have twisted it. To follow the spirit of this age, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. What can be said? What can be said? But that there is massive delusion. There's massive delusion. Trust God. Take all thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Let no thought of yours, let no expression of yours be without obedience to Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ alone is Lord. Jesus Christ alone is God. Jesus Christ alone as King. We are the servants who are called to go and prepare a wedding banquet for him. We are the servants who are called to go out into the world, into the streets, and bring people to our Lord. If we bring people to our Lord who are not dressed for the wedding, we will be liable. If we do not bring people who are prepared to be with our Lord, we will be the ones who will be called as wicked servants as unfaithful stewards of our Lord's message. Jesus said, whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father. Whoever affirms me before men, I will affirm before my Father. He leaves us with the choice. Which one do we want to be? We could do this Christianity thing partly, and we'll be like those who deny the Lord. Or we can do this thing all the way. Accept the whole message of God. Accept all of the claims of the Holy Scripture and the Holy Fathers. And live a life that's holy and pleasing to God. What kind of church do we want to be? What kind of people do we want to be? It's up, it's up to each of us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.